It is Locked On Jazz for the 4th of October. Who is Lowry Markinen and what is he capable of doing? Game two against Portland, what are we looking for? The thing about pace and some fun little notes of the GM survey. It's all coming up on today's edition of Locked On Jazz. Pow! You are Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. How are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA insider. This is Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz, giving you insight, expertise, geeky numbers, and hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan each and every day. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jazz your first listen of the day. We are free and we are available on all podcast apps, including the one you're listening to right now. We are also available for you on YouTube. Our YouTube question of the day, who will be the Jazz best player this year? And I think the answer may turn out to be Lowry Markin. And at least after one night, it certainly feels that way. But there's also some reasonable understanding of why that might be the case as well on this really interesting seven foot tall finished player as you get to learn and know all of our players and i told you we would do a little bit more get to know stuff i didn't do it after game one um so we're kind of digging into into lowry marketing uh today on the program so who is he he he's out of finland he spent a year at the university of arizona he was actually coached by Hanno Metala, the uh, former Ute player in Finland. He's the youngest of three kids. This is kind of the consistent thing we hear about these kids in birth order. He's the youngest of three kids, and he was the seventh pick of the 2017 NBA draft. And, and when you dig into him a little bit and his backstory out of Finland, his dad actually played for Roy Williams' at Kansas. His mom played on the Finnish national team for a long, long time. Um, his brother, Arrow, uh, was a striker for the Dynamo uh, Dresden team in Germany, a soccer player, and his middle brother was a uh, um, was also a basketball player. He played soccer and ice hockey as a kid, as you would in Finland, and then the story is that supposedly he scored a hat trick in a soccer game one day Everyone was all excited, and he came back and was like, I don't, I don't really like this game. I, I want to do something else. Um, it's interesting, in an interview I did with him, Lowry shared with us that he's the one who's driven himself more than anyone. I asked all the players, like, whose praise means the most to you? And he said, you know, I should say my wife, but honestly, it's like, and I think I also asked him who drove them the hardest. And his answer, his answer was that, that himself, that even when he was a little, little kid, he would take the time, he would end up, uh, with he would write down his his own numbers, his own, based on his own performance, and um, you know, tell and, and kind of mark down that this isn't good enough, and um, so he really drove himself more than probably anyone else drove him along the way. He um, and and it's that's kind of an interesting note on him. The youngest of three, he certainly, um, I think fits that kind of the model we talk about with birth order but then this adds a little element to it where he is self-driven enough that he's um even if he's just said like he'd write down he'd do a shooting drill and write down how many he was supposed to make and then he would say that's not good enough um that he didn't did he make more so a very a self-driven uh young man the biggest thing he talked about in, in life was that the the step to go to the u.s um was really a, a massive thing. So here's some interesting notes on him in his career. In his second year in Chicago, and his first year, he really has been struck by the not great coaching bug. He gets Fred Hoiberg, and then he gets Jim Boylan, neither of which turned out to be very successful NBA head coaches. His second year in Chicago, he averages 19 points, nine rebounds, and one assist in 32 minutes. I mean, that's a pretty high-level productivity for a guy that was just 20 years old at the time. He has not played for many winning teams, though. 27, 22, 22, 31 until last year. Um, and then last year in Cleveland, they played him as the three post-All-Star break. 
Once And think about this. Like, he began to figure out what he was doing. He averages 17.6 rebounds. He shoots 46% from the field and 38% from three, with a true shooting percentage of 62, which is really high. He spent 64% of his time last year as the small forward, um, and he spent basically 100% as a power forward in the previous years. Uh, what, what's interesting about Markkinen, and that is, uh, is that over the last three seasons, he shot over 50% as threes. And so who is he and is what can he possibly do? Like, what, what is the next step for Lowry Marketing in his sixth season in the NBA? So let's start there. And, like, he really, one thing that's interesting, if you look at B-Ball Index's numbers on Lowry Marketing, he didn't get very good looks in Cleveland. Now, I don't know if he's going to get very good looks in Utah if he's our, you know, best player and most dominating offensive force. If our starting lineup is Conley, Beasley, Markkinen, Olenek, and... Uh, Vanderbilt, he's our off- he's our primary offensive guy at that point. Um, and so I think when you when you that's that might mean he doesn't get a bunch of looks. So let's look at his game a little bit and what's happened so far. There's some interesting aspects to it. Uh, first of all, his efficiency is going in the completely correct direction. So if you were to look at his cleaning the glass uh, points per shot attempt, his first year, he's in the 35th percentile. Second year, he's in the 32nd percentile. Third year, he's in the 37th. So that's really common. He then gets a real head coach in 2021 in Billy Donovan, and he suddenly goes to the 71st percentile. And then last year, he goes to Cleveland, where he plays the small forward instead, and he goes to the 73rd percentile. What's really interesting when I look at his career, those two projecting up, is also... In his second year in the league, at 21 years old, when he averaged 19 and 9, his usage rate was 23%. So that means he used 23% of all possessions on the floor. That's in the 88th percentile. That's really high. That's really, really high for a 21-year-old. And I'm not sure he ever got the opportunity to, like, learn from that experience. In other words, they turned the team over to him at a pretty high level and then pulled it back. He only played 50 games the next year. It's also the 1920 season, um, which gets hit by COVID in Chicago. It's not good. So I, I don't feel like he ever got that uh, next step to, to look at that. His shot distribution, which we just talked about, is interesting. He's gone from, he took 45% of his shots as a three as his first year. The year he was the primary ball handler, or really the, the high usage year, he only takes 39% of his shots as threes. He then goes to 49% and 51% of his shots as three. So really an outside shooter. But he also has gone from take, he also is taking about 30% of his shots at the rim. So he really just is kind of other than the one year in which he was really told to play with the ball in his hands and try to make a lot of plays and be a higher usage player in in his second year in the NBA, he, in which he was, uh, he took 33% of his shots as a mid-range he really doesn't take, he's really rim or three. Okay. Now let's look into like his three areas of his game and see whether there's a sign that there might be some major development coming for him. And those those three aspects of his game we're going to look into are catch and shoot shooting, off the bounce shooting, so those that's one. How does he do on drives to the basket? What's his isolation game like? And can he play any pick and roll with the ball in his hands? And it's really, really interesting when you look at this one year where he got the whole load sent at him, and then from there, they kind of dropped back and didn't do a lot with him. And we'll, I'll, I'll show you this um, as we continue uh, today on the program. Today's show is brought to you by Built Bar. I was over at the Built Studios the other day, or the Built Factories, and, and with Colin the Taster, and they were doing all sorts of uh, fun tasting. I can't, I, I think I can't tell you exactly, um, but there's some exciting granola bar kind of things coming, uh, and I got to taste them. They were, they were absolutely outstanding. Uh, the German chocolate cake bar is back. Mud pie bar and mud pie puff bars are back. I got a bag full of Built Bars over here. They've been carrying me uh, through the trip. 130 calories, 2.5 fat grams, 4 net carbs, 4 sugars, and 17 
grams of protein. It's all at Built.com. It's the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. And try the Mud Pie Bar and the Mud Pie Puff if you have not already. They're absolutely outstanding. It Locked On 15 is the promo code. Gets you 15% off. Locked On 15. Today's show is also brought to you by my good friends over at Murdoch Hyundai. Located at 4646 South State Street. Also located in Logan and in London. We just bought the Ionic. Might be some reasons if you're wanting an electric car, you're not buying one from a certain somebody today. Jumped on the side of an interesting fellow today. Anyway, get the politics out of the show, but that was pretty interesting. So you might decide you want to buy the Ionic 5 if you want an electric car right now. We love it. It's absolutely been outstanding. Uh, running it up and down the canyon. My daughter goes to school in Salt Lake. We live up the canyon, so we're saving a ton. Uh... That, uh, on gas money. It's nice to not have to pay for gas. It's also just a beautiful car. runs beautifully. We own two Santa Fe's. Why? Because Hyundai, when I did the research, gives you the most bang for the buck. I get bells, whistles, be- safety features, my Santa Fe, and I hit the turning signal, the lights, the miles per hour, and the RPMs flip to cameras so I don't ever have to take my eyes off the road to see if there's somebody in my blind spot. Those kind of things that are so innovative. The back door that doesn't open if a car is coming because it censors it. These are the things that are signature to Hyundai. And for a great price, you can get that. And that's why we've purchased three of them already. If you're going to head over to Murdoch Hyundai, either in Linden, in Logan, or at 4646 South State Street, please stop by and or email me first at dlock09 at gmail.com. And we'll set you up with the meeting. Thanks so much for making Locked on Jazz your first listen of the day. For your second listen, great NFL content up at Locked on NFL on YouTube. So you can grab that. Of course, we've also got all sorts of NBA shows for you, the daily NBA show. But if you're an NFL fan, there's a ton there for you. Check out Game to Game as the weekend recap. We're going to be doing that for the NBA season this year. I'm super excited about it. All right, so let's get to marketing. This is really, really interesting. In his five years in the NBA, and I'm about to sneeze. Excuse me. He has taken every single year, he has taken six catch-and-shoot threes a game. 6, 6, 6, 6, 5.5, 5.8, 5.9, 6.1, 6. Across the board. You round it up, all of them are at 6. So it's pretty interesting. His rookie year, he made 37%. His second year, he made 37%. His third year, he dropped to 34%. Then he spiked to 41%, and last year went to 37%. Okay, he's a 37% catch-and-shoot guy. That's average. Like, catch-and-shoot is about 36% threes. Good catch-and-shoot. Now, in Cleveland, he did not get good looks. That's And at seven feet tall, he doesn't need to look as much as anyone else. And I think, as we've talked about with the Duncan Robinsons and the Boyan Bogdanoviches and the Davis Bertans, the big next trend in this league is these massively tall three-point shooters that can always get their shot off. And so he fits into that in a really, really impressive manner. Um, and so I think that's... I think that's the first one to look at. So his consistent catch it. Off the bounce three, almost non-existent. Point three a game. Just does not have a a, a, a off the bounce catch and shoot game uh, of of any real level at all. Um, in fact, I've got the career numbers for all of our guys um, on catch and shoot as well as off the bounce threes. And he, it's just not something he does. So you're not, you know, that's not an area where if he's going to play on the outside, he's not, you know, taking a sidestep. He's not coming off a shot of that nature. Um, In his career, he's 21 of 79 on pull-up threes, just 26.6%. His catch and shoots, he's 605 on 1,632. So 1,632 catch and shoots. 79 pull-ups. You're just not seeing that. By the way, the best catch-and-shoot guys on the roster, Mike Conley, is at 40%. And Colin Sexton is super good um, on the catch-and-shoot as well. Uh, His numbers on the catch-and-shoot are 41%. And Malik Beasley on the catch-and-shoot, 39.7. So those are the best three catch-and-shoot guys um, on the roster. The Just a side note to have it for you there. All right, so that's it. So now, if if he's only if he's doesn't have the out, then the next game is his drive game. And so, what does Markinen bring with his with his drive game? 
And his drive game's interesting. In the 18-19 season, which is the year in which he scored the 19 points and nine rebounds and he was so heavy usage, he had 319 drives. Not particularly effective. He was at .89 points per drive. Not, not super high. high. But 319, that's a lot. Like, they were really laying it on. The next year it dropped to 212. The next year it dropped to 150. And then last year it was 146. So he's actually driving about half as much the last two years as he did four years ago when he was the number one option, which makes me wonder, like, has he actually had a chance to, like, learn from this or not? His productivity was 0.89, 0.86. Then in 2021, his last year in Chicago, he suddenly was, like, wildly efficient on drives at 1.08, one of the better guys in the league at 1.8 points. And then last year in a pretty crowded floor with Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, we'll see how Donovan and uh, Darius Garland deal with that this year. The He was back down to 0.855 points per drive. So those numbers are not great. This is like, what is he capable of? This is the next question is, can he develop a drive game that he didn't, that he has previously had with some efficiency that he hasn't shown in other years? The other one would be isolation. So now he's getting it. He doesn't have a catch and shoot. Can he just go to work on someone? And again, in the year in which they used him a ton, he had 176 isolations. He hasn't had 176 isolations since. So what's so interesting to me about marketing and what we're getting at here is three years ago in the 18-19 season, his second year, just 20 years old or 21, they lay it on him. He And they only win 22 games. And he averages 19 points and 9 rebounds. And then they just start pulling back and not giving him more of his game. Now they draft guys and Chicago does various things with the roster changes. But I, I wonder whether he's ever gotten a chance to util- learn those skills and get better. So he had 176 isolations in the year which he was heavy. The next year he had 48. And the next year he had 75. Now... He was at the most efficient year was the year when he had 176. He was at 0.89 points per isolation. Not great. Not terrible, actually. Isolation is not a super efficient play, so not terrible. Um, But he's never – he actually hasn't gotten better. He's dropped to 0.66, then 0.81, 0.81, but not used. The other one, again, same concept here, is the pick and roll, which is weird. You're not going to really put a seven-footer in the pick and roll because then chances are they're going to switch it every time. But he does have some ball handling skills, and if you're suddenly trying to use him and maybe dribble handoff and doing some things with him, well, here's what's super interesting. In the 18-19 season, he ran 91 pick and rolls. Again, not a ton, but because, you know, 91 is like one a game, one or two. He was pretty good, 1.024. Since then, we're going to get to the same story. He's run about 100. So, to me, the story, as we look at all these numbers on, on Lowry Marketing, is certainly he hasn't been anything more than a catch-and-shoot player in the NBA. That's what he's been his best thing. Um, he, But in his second year of the NBA, the Chicago Bulls, like, gave it to him at 21 years old or 20 years old, when he, and he wasn't clearly ready for it. And they lost games. He was 21. And he wasn't greatly efficient. His effective field goal percentage was in the 21st percentile. And then to me, they just pivoted. They didn't say to them, they didn't say, well, all right, let's see what you can learn from that. Like, you're, we're we're playing you as a kind of a ball creating, ball handling, wing player. We're giving you all these opportunities and we're not, and you're shooting it, you know, 15 times a game. And by the time you come back the next year, You've actually gone from 32 minutes to 29. Now, the fact he plays 30 minutes almost every game tells you how valuable he is. And instead of 15 shots, we're giving you 11. And then the next year, we're giving you 10. And to me, that's like, that That to me is a really fascinating aspect of Markkanen's career. That 18-19 that season, when he's the man, they just never let him build off that. And, I mean, Zach Levine was the primary guy, so he's playing off Zach Levine. Levine was taking 18 shots. Markin's playing 15, but, like, he's their number two option on that team. And then I don't think he ever got a chance to develop out of it. I'm going to go talk to him about this. It'll be interesting to hear what he has to say. 
um, about that. They add, you know, they added Kobe White, who was kind of a rookie who took a bunch of shots. They added Wendell Carter Jr., who took some of the space on the floor. Um, they and and the other thing is, as I've said, and I'm not trying to be you know overly dramatic about it. He's just not had very good coaches, right? He had Fred Hoiberg, who went 27 and 55. He then had Fred Hoiberg, who got fired 24 games in. Then he had Jim Boylan, which was not a good situation in Chicago. And then in 2021, he gets Billy Donovan as a head coach. And when Billy Donovan becomes his head coach, well, by that time, they've suddenly added Nick Lavukovic, uh, and he becomes, you know, the fourth guy on the usage train, and they end up moving. He signs with Cleveland in the offseason. So I'm, I'm really curious to see what he can do um, in, in this matchup. All right, game two against Portland. I, I think we're really looking for a lot of the same things. We're looking for pace. That's what, you know, Will Hardy's talking about that. Um, the thing about pace by the way, um, the thing about pace that I, I do want to point out that I think is worth mentioning, and everyone talks about pace, and I understand it. The, the metrics are pretty dominant about what happens if you get into um, your offense quickly and what happens if you um, can get easy baskets and the points per possessions are dramatically different and it's all the right reasons to talk about it and you play with force. But the fact is, the Toronto Raptors played the second fewest amount of possessions last year in half court, and they still played 75% of their possessions in the half court. So, yes, we want to play with pace. We want to be in the we want to be between 75 and 80% of our possessions in the half court, meaning that 20% of our possessions aren't in the half court or more. Yes, 100%. But we also better be able to execute in the half court because you're going to spend se- at, at at best you're still spending 75% of your time in the half court. And I thought there were a lot of nice half court execution things that happened the other night uh, with some handoffs and some spacing and getting in the lane and some open looks. And I, and against an, you know, a team that was really pretty horrific defensively last year under Chauncey Billups in Portland, I think it'll be interesting to see whether or not the Jazz can do some things, whereas they are playing this kind of incredible, long, athletic, switching team against Toronto. So as much as, yes, we're playing with pace, and yes, we're playing with force, I'm actually really curious to watch this in the half court tonight and watch the handoff game and watch the five-out game and see where whether or not we can kind of get some get lines, lanes to the basket um, and see whether some open opportunities there and see whether the ball continues to move um, more. And that's, to me... As much as it's kind of force and pace that we're talking about, I'm actually curious to start watching half court and see what we're able to do there. Because even if we become an elite running team, we're still spending 75 to 78 uh, percent of our time in the half court. And you're going to have to be able to make some plays um, in the half court. And our offense is structured to play this kind of movement, five out, Olenek handing it off, doing things of that nature. Marking and making a play here or there, swinging it to the next guy and seeing whether we can get that kind of energy and that opportunity. So that's that's what I'm watching for uh, tonight on the offensive end. On the defensive end, it's just being in people, like impeding progress. I always I talk about this a lot when I watch college players. Just do you own the space? I think what Will Hardy would like to see our defensive players do is own the space that they're supposed to be in. And I'm not sure we're seeing that in the second half of the game. There were a bunch of plays where guys were really, there's one Rodri Gay was right in front of me, just gave way too much space. Like, we got to be in on their space and impact them, change their angles, change their routes. Um, You know, we had that problem last year. We just relied on Rudy so much um, in in that it just kind of became these straight line drives on the way in. Crazy note from Kevin Kelton. If you're a gambler, I'll share that with you. As well as the GM survey came out. I thought there were some interesting things on that. That's all as we continue on today's edition of Locked on Jazz. Hey, we're doing our NBA season previews coming up here. These are pretty amazing. Um, it is the, and it is, make sure you grab it. Uh, it is the ultimate pro basketball preview. It starts October 10th, so that's six days from now. It's a six-episode extravaganza ready, getting you ready for the NBA season. Local team experts of Locked On, NBA insiders, and Locked On Podcast Network and Odyssey all combining into one ultimate NBA preview. It starts October 10th, so search Ultimate Pro Basketball Preview on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get this podcast. GM Servant, Kevin Pelton with Zach Lowe. My guy Pelton's not coming down today. He went to the game last night. Um, I actually went to Seattle yesterday. 
I didn't get to the game. I was supposed to, but I didn't quite make it. Um, 70% of the teams over the last, I don't remember exactly what period of time, over the last period of time, whose over-under was below 25, 70% of them go over. You, like, are convinced when you're at this point of an NBA season. He also had the note, by the way, that 57% or, you know, more, which is a pretty good betting line, by the way, uh, of the teams that go over 50 go under. So here are the teams. The Celtics are at 54. The Nets are at 50.5. The Nuggets are at 50.5. The Warriors are at 52. The Clippers are at 52.5. The Bucks are at 53. And what Pel and the Phoenix Suns are at 52.5. And what Pelton's saying is over half those teams will end up under 50 this year. Wow. So Phoenix, t- pick which teams are you picking to go under under 50? Phoenix, 76ers, Milwaukee, put it in the chat room here. If you uh, on YouTube, if you're with us on YouTube, Warriors over under they're at 52. Denver at 50.5. Brooklyn at 50.5, and the Celtics at 54. The other one is that those teams that are un 25 or under. So Houston 23.5. He based Indiana 23.5. He says 70% of these teams end up going over. So when you start projecting team or Oklahoma City 23.5, the San Antonio 22.5, Utah 24.5. So there's five teams right now in the I, I feel like there should be a six. Utah 24.5. San Antonio, 22.5. Oh, Orlando's not in it. Oklahoma City at 23.5. And Indiana at 23.5. And Houston at 23.5. So those five are all 70%. So either three or five of those will go over 20, will go over on their over-under projections. Kind of an interesting note from from Pelton today on that. Um, So we're in the bottom five on over-unders. From a lottery standpoint, that's really what you're shooting for. All right, a few interesting notes on the NBA.com GM survey. One of them was really interesting is the player you'd build your franchise around. Last year was Luka, and this year is Giannis. Like, I, I'm wondering what swapped in the offseason that people went from Luka to Giannis. So that's interesting to me. Most likely to break out Evan Mobley, Cade Cunningham, Anthony Edwards, Zion Williamson. So the GMs are not that original. Donovan got no votes as best shooting guard. Rudy got no votes as best center. Surprising. Yet the Cavs and Wolves got the votes for best offseason, but so did the Jazz. The vote for the best offseason was the Cavs, and then the Wolves and Jazz were second on the GM survey. The best perimeter defender, Marcus Smart, Drew Holiday, Kawhi Leonard, Mikel Bridges. Alex Jensen received a vote on best assistant coach. They asked who your best leader is. How is it not Steph Curry? They voted, they said it was Chris Paul. How is it not Steph Curry? Are you not paying attention? Incredible to me. Um, they forty three percent had the Bucks to win it. Twenty one percent the Warriors. Twenty percent the Clippers. Top four in the East: Bucks, Boston, Sixers, Brooklyn. Interesting. Not Miami. Cleveland, I think, was six. In the West, Clippers 1, Golden State 2, Phoenix 3, Denver 4, Memphis 5, Dallas 6, Minnesota in the play-in. We'll take that draft pick. Um, I totally think Minnesota's going to be a top-four team in the West, by the way. 
Just want to share that. And last and finally on the GM survey, best home court advantage. Jazz fans, still there, baby. Still there. Like 18% of the vote for the Jazz fans is the best home court advantage. They have not forgotten what you can do. Jazz and the Blazers, I'll talk to you tonight. Thanks so much for tuning in.